Greetings and welcome to the key opinion leader call, Why Exosomes Are Uniquely Suited for Vaccine Development, hosted by Capricorn Therapeutics. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, A.J. Bergman, Chief Financial Officer for Capricor Therapeutics. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, and thank you for joining our call. Before we start, I would like to state that we will be making certain forward-looking statements during today's presentation. These statements may include statements regarding, among other things, the efficacy, safety, and intended utilization of our product candidates, our future research and development plans, including our anticipated conduct, finding of preclinical and clinical studies, our plans to present or report additional data, our plans regarding regulatory filings, potential regulatory developments involving our product candidates, and our possible uses of existing cash and investment resources. The forward-looking statements are based on current information, assumptions, and expectations that are subject to change, involve a number of risks and uncertainties, and may cause actual results to differ materially from those contained in the forward-looking statements. These and other risks are described in our periodic filings made with the Securities and Exchange Commission, including our quarterly and annual reports. We are cautioned not to place undue reliance on these forward-looking statements. We disclaim any obligation. With that, I'll turn the call over to Linda Marban, CEO. Good morning. I am Linda Marban, the Chief Executive Officer of Capricorn Therapeutics. I want to thank you for joining us today during these unprecedented times to discuss exosomes as a platform for vaccine development with Dr. Stephen Gould of Johns Hopkins University. I hope you have been following our recent announcements in regards to our exosome program and are as excited as we are with the direction of this important program. Now first, let me begin with some good news. Yesterday, we strengthened our balance sheet by raising approximately $5 million. This capital raise is important and strategic because it gives us runway, likely through 2021, to support our programs and continue to build out our plans for exosomes as a therapeutic platform. Now, as we have reported and been talking about frequently, we will have data coming in, in the, during the second quarter from our HOPE2 clinical trial, which is investigating CAP1002, our cell therapy product candidate for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. While we anxiously await the data from that trial, we are carefully planning the regulatory strategy we will pursue to hopefully bring that therapeutic to those with advanced stages of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. At the same time and behind the scenes, we have been strategically building our exosome program. For some of you, the concept that Capricor is developing a vaccine program based on exosomes may seem like a shift in strategy, but actually, for us, it is really just a tactical change. It is the culmination of several years of work that began with the discovery of the exosomes made by our cells, the CDCs, cardiosphere-derived cells, identifying the exosomes as the mechanism of action of the cells, and ultimately deciding that we wanted to harness the power of the exosome as nature's delivery vehicle. Now, we realized that we had the opportunity to not just isolate exosomes from cells, but that the cells could be custom engineered to be delivered payloads of choice, which potentially may allow for many interesting opportunities for the treatment of disease. So whether our goal is to immunize a patient against a dreaded disease or fix a genetic mutation, we believe that exosome-based technologies may offer the opportunity to do so. Now, I did just say engineer the cells. What I meant is that we will engineer the cells to produce exosomes that will ultimately carry payloads of choice. A pivotal part of our plan was to bring the best and the brightest to enable Capricorn to deliver on this strategy. For a long time, Dr. Stephen Gould has been working on exosomes and fostering their development as therapeutics. He is a founder of the ASEMV, the American Society of Extracellular and Microvesicles, and it was through this affiliation that I first made his acquaintance. I was immediately struck by Dr. Gould's ability to think through the details of taking a scientific discovery to a product. So as you know, one of Capricor's core missions is to bring therapies from bench to bedside. 
We have a lot of experience in working with academics, and we are now planning to follow the same strategy in our affiliation with Dr. Gould and his laboratory. Now let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Stephen Gould. Dr. Stephen J. Gould is the professor of biological chemistry at Johns Hopkins University, director of the Johns Hopkins University Graduate Program in Biological Chemistry, and as I mentioned a few moments ago, a co-founder of the American Society for Exosomes and Microvesicles. Dr. Gould's research interests lie at the intersection of cell biology and human disease, especially as they relate to exosomes. Dr. Gould's work was the first to reveal the mechanistic link between exosome biogenesis and virus budding, the first to identify mechanisms of exosome engineering, and first, together with his collaborator, Dr. Florence Solaro, to show that engineered RNA-loaded exosomes are an effective treatment for primary liver cancers. Dr. Gould has published more than 100 research articles, numerous invited reviews, and several book chapters. He has served on dozens of NIH and other grant review panels, reviewed scores of research articles, organized numerous scientific conferences, and is the recipient of numerous public and private research grants. Dr. Gould earned his doctorate at the University of California, San Diego, after receiving his bachelor's degree from the University of California in Santa Barbara. Now I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Gould, and I'm going to ask you to share today your current thinking on exosomes as a platform for vaccine development for all those who have called in this morning. Thank you, Dr. Gould. Oh, thanks, Linda, for the kind words. Um, uh, hello to everybody. Um, I'll just uh, give my introduction here. Uh, I, I am, a, as uh, Linda said, a professor of biological chemistry at Johns Hopkins University you know, where I, I run a research lab, and this is my primary affiliation, my primary uh, job. Um, we also uh, are involved in a, a wide range of exosome-related research activities and organizational activities. And I, as part of my role at Johns Hopkins University, it's incumbent upon me to start every presentation with a listing of all my real and potential conflicts. Uh, so I, I do consulting work be, beyond my job at Johns Hopkins with a number of companies. I have equity, royalty, or license agreements with a number of companies, those that are starred or those in which I actually own some amount of equity. And I'm funded by a mixture of private and public uh, sources, uh, our, re our researches. Now, one of the things that brings us all here today is the ongoing uh, COVID-19 pandemic. This is the screenshot from this phenomenal website that uh, Johns Hopkins University runs. This is from a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can just see the, the, the numbers there were scary at the time, it was 100,000 in just the last two weeks. It's quadrupled across the world, um, as have the deaths. So uh, in the midst of this pandemic, uh, one of the questions becomes, what are the various approaches that scientists can take to try to uh, fight this disease? And what I'm going to do in the next few slides is to try and concisely describe exosome field and exosome biology to you, and a little bit of what we're trying to do to uh, develop exosome-based vaccines um, in, in, our, in our research group. So for those of you who aren't familiar, exosomes uh, are a subclass of what are referred to as extracellular vesicles. So extracellular vesicles are all secreted vesicles that are made by cells. Uh, exosomes are the smallest subgroup of these. They're very small particles, only about 30 to 150 nanometers in size and diameter. And they show signs of active assembly. And what I mean by that is that if you look at the proteins and lipids and nucleic acids that are in these secreted vesicles, they're all obviously derived from the cell. But a, a large number of them are highly enriched in the secreted vesicle relative to their concentration in the cell, which suggests an active assembly, active targeting process. They're released by all cells. They're abundant in all biofluids uh, uh, that have been assayed. And they, they play uh, complex roles in biology in normal conditions by allowing cells to communicate with one another in complex and multifactorial uh, ways. 
and in a wide range of diseases, uh, uh, allowing cancer cells, for example, or damaged tissue to actually alter the gene expression profiles and signaling profiles of the cells in their neighborhood and also cells at a distance. Now, uh, what this cartoon shows you are all these vesicles in suspension. If you were to look at the extracellular vesicles, say in the blood or the cerebrospinal fluid, uh, and you could see it at this resolution, you would see that the fluid is full of these small vesicles. But even this one subclass of vesicles is very heterogeneous in size. Cartoon also shows a number of the very interesting proteins that have been reported on exosomes. I just caution, there probably is no exosome that has all of these proteins on it, but this is just a cartoon to represent some of the very interesting proteins that we find on them. There are growth factors, growth factor receptors, various kinds of signaling molecules, cell adhesion molecules, and of course inside uh, the exosome are RNA molecules that have the ability to drive uh, gene expression changes in recipient cells. The electron micrograph shows what they look like at the ultrastructural level. They're very small. Uh, they don't really have any distinguishing feature other than that they are bound by a single membrane. They just kind of look like a ball with some content in size. Now, um, the uh, exosomes that are released by any one cell or found in any biofluid are highly heterogeneous in size, even the small class are. And the size distribution profile for a, a, a sample exosome prep is shown in the graph on the bottom where the blue bars show the relative percentage population and, the, uh, and on the long the uh, x-axis is the, is the size and diameter. And this is fairly typical of what people see. So there is no single uniform size to these vesicles, nor is there any single uniform composition, but that's okay because in a given bioreactor system, uh, you can still generate a very uniform batch characteristics of vesicles. Now, one of the things that's uh, uh, been extremely helpful to us in understanding exosome biogenesis and exosome engineering uh, was to really follow how a number of individual exosomal proteins are made by the cell and how they make their way into secreted vesicles. And I'll just summarize in this cartoon what we know at this point in time. These small vesicles, <coughs> excuse me, these small vesicles are made uh, both at endosome membranes and at plasma membrane. Uh, some forms of plasma membrane are really at the cell surface. Some forms of plasma membrane are in deep invaginations within the cell. And all three of these sources of exosomes contribute to what a cell secretes and releases into the medium. Now, to give you a better idea of the, the size of, the, of, of these particles that we're talking about, uh, this, there's a cartoon here on uh, slide nine where you can see the, the relative sizes on the top of a potassium ion, an adrenaline molecule, a, a typical growth factor, and an exosome. And what this reveals is that an exosome as a single unit is far more complicated than any typical signaling molecule. And in fact, it's comprised of a very large number of different molecules, um, you know, literally dozens to hundreds of different proteins and different RNAs, each in a single particle. And even though exosomes are much larger than your average signaling molecule and, and are uh, uh, composed of multiple bioactive molecules, they're still vastly smaller than a cell. And so on the bottom a diagram sort of shows the relative size of an exosome, which is that tiny dot, uh, and then a microvesicle, which is another type of secreted vesicle, which is much larger in, in purple there. And then to the right, just the edge of a cell to give you the relative size of a cell. So one of the things I'd like you to take away from this is that exosomes are, are extremely small, but much more uh, complex and larger than typical signaling molecule. And they're very hard to measure with great determination uh, on a single particle basis, although we can. Um, and just keep in mind that the, that the exosome is roughly one-tenth the wavelength of uh, the smallest wavelength of light. So these are very small particles. Now, what makes exosomes attractive as a therapeutic or a drug delivery vehicle or a vaccine template? And it, it's tried to get this idea across in this slide here, 
where you can see on the left the graph of how concentration falls with distance from a point source. And uh, you know, concentration falls is a, uh, by the inverse cube law, which means from a single point source and, and with diffusion alone was governing the process, uh, you find the concentration falling dramatically with distance. Um, and this is also true for exosomes in, as, as, individual, uh, as individual entities. But when you look at the exosomes themselves, concentrations of the molecules on the exosomes do not change relative to one another as you go away from the point source. And uh, this is not the most uh, elegant demonstration of this point, but what I'm trying to get across here is that when cells want to send multifactorial signals to another cell, um, doing it on an exosome is far more uh, efficient and effective uh, for a variety of reasons. So one of which is that you get enhanced signaling from a single molecule. So rather than the cell interacting with one growth factor, uh, uh, an exosome can actually uh, deliver signals from dozens or hundreds of individual copies of that one molecule. Um, you also can get multidimensional signaling because multiple signaling molecules can be placed on the surface and are placed on the surface. And in fact, exosomes can even deliver biochemical pathways from cell to cell. So there are much different and much more complex and in some cases effective signaling platform than your standard uh, single molecule signaling systems that exist in biology. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is exosomes, at, at, uh, both in terms of their normal biology and as a drug delivery platform, is that they accumulate wherever there are sites of vascular leakiness. So in our vasculature uh, throughout our body, the uh, permeability limit uh, is around, uh, around 10 nanometers or so. Uh, in the blood-brain barrier, it's even smaller, about one nanometers. So anything larger than that really doesn't get out of the circulation and into the tissues. This is quite a bit uh, different, though, in the liver under normal conditions. Uh, liver has a very high uh, permeability uh, to particles, and so exosomes can come into the liver uh, very easily under normal conditions. Uh, the other thing that, no, that's significant about this is that uh, sites of infection, uh, wounds, uh, sites of inflammation and tumors have extremely high vascular permeability. So as an injectable uh, for therapeutic purposes, exosomes have the ability to deliver drugs to sites of infection, to wounds, to sites of inflammation, and to tumors in cancer patients. Now, one of the things that uh, you know, brings us all here today is uh, whether exosomes can be used to make vaccines. And my comments here are we'll try and keep them relatively brief so that there's time for questions. Uh, but we have a, a couple of different approaches that we're using uh, to uh, try and use exosomes uh, for vaccination purposes. So uh, the, the first of these, what we refer to as exosome display vaccines, and these are recombinant products with a very clear pipeline. We start with a, a cell platform that's approved for biologics production, and into that uh, cell line, we introduce the genes that encode, uh, in the case of a viral vaccine, uh, the viral antigens anchored to uh, exosomes uh, so that when the cell makes exosomes, it's actually pre, you know, uh, generating particles that are loaded with the antigens of interest, which we want the, the injected subject to raise uh, uh, immune responses. Um, so once we make these cell lines, of course, we, we just simply have to collect the exosomes from them, and then these exosomes are reloaded with uh, large quantities of the antigens of interest. And um, they can be purified really quite easily by a highly scalable filtration chromatography procedure. And the end product of that uh, essentially is the vaccine. Um, and this can be delivered by a standard intramuscular injection and boost protocol. So this is one platform that we're developing for uh, vaccines and that Capricor is partnering with us uh, to investigate and develop. The other way we're going about using exosomes to make vaccines is to use the high uh, degree of tolerance uh, to exosomes to deliver mRNA vaccines into the body. So this is a very simple concept uh, in which we take exosomes, 
and we mix them with mRNAs that are uh, designed to be stable and to encode uh, target antigens to which we want the immune system to develop a response. And we use a special exosome mRNA loading reagent, uh, combine them all together uh, to make a formulation that then can be injected and lead to mRNA expression in the host cells, uh, which induces an immune response that provides protection. So again, it's a very simple uh, approach, um, and we are, we are working on this with Capricor, and we're working on it in the context of the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, infection uh, and virus. So we're right now in the, in the process of generating the, the SARS-CoV-2 display vaccine, um, and this is essentially designed to put the viral proteins in their native context in the vesicle, uh, which is how they look on a virus. Um, these are then human cells derived, uh, recombinant production platform, and it's a four-part antigen design for balanced antigen presentation and immunity. And the important part here is that this is a, a vaccine that has the viral uh, antigens. It looks like a virus, but it's a virus-free platform, so there's no infection risk uh, in this type of a vaccine. The second one that we're developing together with Capricar is the SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccine. And what we're doing here is we're combining uh, in vitro synthesized mRNAs that encode the antigens of interest, exosomes, and a loading reagent and then this tripartite design, uh, which is also engineered for balanced antigen presentation and immunity, um, uh, will uh, be injected uh, for the development of protective immunity to the virus. Um, again, these are uh, research projects at present. Uh, we are well underway on both of them, and we, we look forward to seeing how they work. And with that, I think I'm done with my presentation, and I'd like to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Our first question comes from the line of Joe Panginus with H.C. Wainwright. Please proceed with your question. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and uh, hope you're all well, and thank you, Dr. Gould, for the, uh, all the details here today. Um, I'd like to focus my question on looking forward towards, you know, potentially getting these exosomes to markets and looking at the safety and regulatory environment as well as manufacturing. So when you look at the, um, especially, for example, the display vaccines, obviously you'll have your antigens of choice that you want to be part of the payloads, but how do you necessarily control for what else these exosomes are pinching off from the cell that might contain things that you might not want, including potentially, say, negative immunomodulatory um, compounds? That's a great question. Um, one of the keys to doing this is to work with a cell line that does not express those proteins. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, you're aware of this, but uh, exosomes have been implicated in immunosuppression in certain cancer models due to their, uh, the presence of PD-L1 uh, and, and some certain other uh, immunosuppressive proteins on the surface. We work with a cell line that does not express those proteins, so that's a key first step, and we control for that. Um, in addition, our expression and uh, uh, cell culture conditions during which we uh, produce our modified exosomes drive extraordinarily high levels of expression of the proteins that we want to put into the exosome, such high levels that they actually compete out many of the other cargos. So although we are nowhere near close to having completely uh, uh, a complete control over exosome content, our production system that we've uh, been inventing here at Johns Hopkins is getting us closer and closer to that goal all the time. So it's a concern, and of course, we're always going to have to control for these during batch production, uh, but uh, we think that we've mitigated a lot of those uh, issues in our, in our technology. 
that that's very helpful thanks and I guess my follow-on would be is you know uh, even in your one of your initial charts showing that uh, you see various um, you know sizes of exosomes that are you know basically spit out of the cell so when you look towards um, approval criteria or, or rather um, say release criteria of the specifications for FDA approval um, what sort of I guess bounds could you expect to see like do you see that uh, you'd have to have specific sizes that you'd need to isolate through your filtration methods and how you can control for or would the FDA um, require you to I, have some sort of um, identification of the payloads and um, you know certain concentrations etc yeah, this is an evolving aspect of the field right now. Uh, what I would say is that our purification strategy already eliminates the vast majority of significant uh, contaminating vesicle sizes. So we're left with a very small subset of vesicles to begin with. And as you point out, they are heterogeneous. However, the, the degree of heterogeneity in our preps is actually less than what one sees in, in uh, commercial and clinical lipid nanoparticle preps, which actually display even greater uh, uh, variability in size. So we, we don't feel that there's a lot to be gained by trying to further subdivide by size. Um, and on top of that, there really is no existing technology to do that. Uh, we don't really think it's going to be uh, a, an important factor, in particularly in the case of vaccines, where really you're using these to elicit an immune response. I think that's more of a question that becomes potentially of concern in terms of therapeutics delivery. But again, it would really depend on the kind of therapeutics you're trying to generate. Uh, so for example, if one is simply trying to generate a, you know, a, a, a much better version of say a, a trap uh, type of decoy receptor, it probably wouldn't matter so much. If you are committed to delivering a very specific RNA into the cytoplasm of a very specific uh, subtype of cells, it might be more of an issue. So it's a good question. Um, I don't think it's really going to be uh, a, a barrier here in the area of vaccine development, though. No, very helpful. And then actually just one last question. I don't know if this is proprietary yet for the company or you. Um, with regard to your um, COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, vaccines, either display or mRNA, I don't know if you can describe sort of where these stand right now. Like have you even identified the um, actual payloads that you want to go into these yet? Yeah, uh, we, we, we're, we're, well, we're, uh, excuse me. we're well past that point. Um, uh, we are very optimistic. Uh, let's, let's just put it this way. Um, the animal studies are, are being organized at present. Got it. Thank you very much for the details and good luck. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, if you'd like to join the question queue, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. We'll pause a moment to allow for more questions. So, Steve, I have... Um this is Linda, obviously. I have a question from the webcast. Um, you know, the, the COVID-19 space is, is crowded. I think um, it is a global effort to try and, and develop uh, technologies to deal with this scourge that is affecting all of humanity. Um, if um, we are successful in this exercise of bringing a vaccine forward for COVID-19, um, we would be, you know, very lucky and, and grateful for that. But can you describe for a few moments how this development, how developing of this platform um, can be used in other indications? Is it, does it have op opportunities in oncology? Does it have opportunities for other infectious diseases? Just so that people listening in can understand uh, the, the broad nature of this technology. Sure, Linda, that's a, a good point. What we're trying to generate here is a platform uh, where it's sort of a plug and play type of technology that whenever there's an inf emerging infectious disease, we can use the technologies that we're basically inventing and putting into practice uh, in the context of the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic to any others. Uh, the principles that we're generating, in fact, many of the systems we're generating here could be applied to flu vaccines, uh, other uh, infectious um, um, uh, pathogen vaccines. And as you mentioned, there's also the, a, a, a potential here for uh, contributing to the uh, cancer uh, vaccine field. Um, and these are things that we, we want to explore in the future. Um, but uh, right now we are in the middle of this pandemic, so we are focused uh, primarily here on, on the COVID-19 
um, and its underlying uh, viral uh, um, cause. So uh, I just will say one more thing. You know, we are extremely enthusiastic to see the great outpouring of ideas in every aspect of molecular and cell biology that's being applied to this pandemic. We hope they all work. <laughs> that's what we're hoping they all work. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to contribute to the effort, you know, hopefully to generate something that's actually successful, but importantly, to take approaches that are not being uh, taken by many other groups of any other groups. So uh, this, is a, this is a somewhat new way to try to approach vaccine strategies. Uh, we think it has a lot of potential, and we're, we're confident uh, that we'll be able to execute the plans, and we, we do think we'll be successful in getting vaccines. And, and once we do, we think it's going to be a, a platform that can be a broad use. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, I agree, and I, I echo uh, Dr. Gould's enthusiasm. This has been um, you know, really game-changing for the company, but also for me as I've understood the, the power of this opportunity for COVID-19. Along that line, there's another question from the webcast, Steve, um, which asks why um, would an exosome vaccine be better than traditional approaches um, you know, for the development of, of other types of infectious diseases or even immuno-oncology? What, what makes an exosome special? Well, in the context of viral infections, uh, m many of the viruses that we're looking at uh, to generate vaccines towards are enveloped viruses. So the way our immune system normally interacts with them is in the context of a, of a, of a vesicle. Um, and uh, exosome-based vaccines are vesicular in nature. So we think that it provides a much uh, closer to native uh, context uh, with which to stimulate the immune system. And in this sense, it's quite a bit different from other approaches that are based on, you know, purification of recombinant proteins um, in outside their context of a vesicle and uh, immunization in that, in that form. So we think that's a major advantage of the exosome uh, display technology. And as far as the mRNA delivery, uh, one of the issues with lipid nanoparticles in general is that they have a tendency to be poorly tolerated by the host and recognized as foreign whereas our exosome-based mRNA delivery uh, platform basically, uh, you know, uh, protects the mRNAs, uh, encompassing them within a vesicle that is well-tolerated by, uh, by people, and so uh, much less likely to elicit inflammatory responses uh, on their own, and more effective at actually delivering the mRNA in a functional form into, into cells that can then express those mRNAs express the proteins, and then stimulate the protective immune response in the immunized. Thank you. I believe there's another question uh, coming in. Thank you. Yes, our next question comes from line of Ed Tetoff with Piper Sandler. Please proceed with your question. Great. Thank you very much, and I appreciate this update. I've always thought of uh, exosomes as just an ideal uh, delivery vehicle for uh, for extracellular content, and I think um, a vaccine approach makes a ton of sense. What, um, two questions if I may, how quickly can these be engineered? And is there any thought or um, technology that looks at maybe decorating the exterior of the exosome, for lack of a better term, with, um, factors or binding moieties that may enhance or even target uptake into the immune system for, um, uh, for immunogenic purposes? Thank you. Uh, great question. Um, we, we think alike. So I, all I can tell you right now is that that's exactly part of what we, what's involved in our technology. I'll, I'll hang out and wait, and, and I appreciated your commentary on the regulatory side and the manufacturing side, because I think that's going to be very important in terms of characterizing um, the exosome. So thanks very much for your important work. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Shan Chan with Berenberg. Please proceed with your question. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for hosting the webinar. So I'm very interested in uh, messenger RNA encoding target antigens, and obviously you are 
right now organizing animal studies to have the preliminary evaluation. Do you have a general idea of uh, what are those uh, target antigens? Are they a part of the S protein or any of the envelope proteins? And I have a follow-up. Um, good question. Um, our, uh, we, as I mentioned, we have a tripartite mRNA design, and our, uh, our thinking on this and our, our formulation is based on a wide range of studies demonstrating that effective and long-lasting immunity uh, must stimulate the cellular uh, arm of adaptive responses. Um, so we, part, of our, uh, part of the, uh, our mRNA is um, simply, designed, <coughs> excuse me, simply designed to elicit antibody responses to the receptor binding domain of the uh, spike protein. Um, but uh, we, other two components in our mRNA uh, platform are designed to uh, generate class one and class two loaded peptides at high efficiency, um, both for antibody production uh, stimulation, but also to stimulate long-term immunity. To the, to the virus. So it, it's complex, and I, I can't get into the details, but um, we are looking, uh, our, our mRNAs are comprised of antigens from all four structural proteins of the virus, and those are the S, M, E, and N proteins. Great, thank you. And uh, just, the, uh, just as you mentioned that you're trying to elicit a high level of uh, class 1 and 2 MHD response, have you evaluated the, the delivery efficiency to antigen-presenting cells with your exosome platform? That is uh, um, it, uh, the kind of experiments that are uh, on the Blackboard right now. We're, we're, we're getting to that stage. Right now, we're still in the formulation and in sort of preliminary uh, delivery stages, but obviously a more sophisticated analysis of delivery to different types of cells in the host is going to be one of the things we'll be looking at. Last one from me. I mean, since you're the leader of a very, pla uh, very powerful platform for drug delivery, if we think about the potential clinical endpoints for COVID-19 vaccine, and especially if your competitors are talking about a uh, potential release before autumn. How should we think about using surrogate biomarkers as the clinical endpoint for vaccine development? Thank you so much for answering my, all my questions. Um, excuse me. Oh, uh, yeah. Good point. Um, yeah. Of course. We, in in a, in a in a vaccine study, obviously the gold standard is whether or not you protect individuals from infection and disease. Um, those studies are complex, expensive, long lasting, uh, and take a while to, to analyze. Obviously, uh, both in our small animal, our uh, non human primate, and in clinical trials, we would be performing detailed. Uh, analysis of immune responses, uh, both humoral and cellular, in the vaccinated subjects. So yes, we have multiple endpoints uh, to the animal and clinical trials plan. Does that address your question? Yes, perfect. Thank you. OK. So, uh, Steve, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this has been very helpful. And I will just um, ask one question from my desk. Can you elaborate a little bit um, on what the previous uh, question um, entailed, which was timeline? So, you know, our competitors are saying they will be in uh, human subjects by the fall. Um, can you kind of give an idea of what you think our timelines will be in terms of getting into animals and then ultimately into patients, um, all things being equal? You know, yeah, it's always difficult to predict the future uh, in a developmental project like this, but we are uh, very far uh, into our display vaccine uh, uh, project right now. Uh, we, uh, if, if progress continues at the pace it's been uh, moving, we anticipate being into our animal models within a month 
Um, and some of these animal models are short. Uh, some of them are longer. Uh, some of them do not measure in, uh, infectivity. Others do. Uh, our anticipation is that, uh, you know, provided that the research enterprise continues uh, uh, to go uh, unaltered by the pandemic, uh, we, we too hope to be into uh, clinical trials in, in 2020. Um, as for the mRNA vaccine, we're it's a little bit uh, behind. It's just a different uh, time course study, um, but we have the same kind of projections uh, currently. So I, I, I think these are not particularly difficult vaccines to produce. Um, uh, so we, we don't anticipate significant problems in getting them actually into animal studies you know, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the timeline of between, uh, you know, two to four months, one to four months, that, that kind of time scale. But again, I can't really predict that, and that is, that is our provisional estimation, uh, not something that can be uh, absolutely, you know, rock solid at this point in time. Great. So um, thank you. Um, another couple of questions from the webcast. Um, one is you mentioned that um, we are um, – embarking on a strategy that involves all four proteins. Um, at Capricor, we call them MENS, M-E-N-S. Um, can you explain uh, for the listeners um, what the potential um, of a four-protein vaccine is in corona or, or other types of applications? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, um, obviously uh, one part of an effective uh, vaccine uh, uh, strategy is to try to generate uh, uh, protective antibodies that target the receptor binding domain of the S protein. Uh, however, uh, the history of, of vaccines in the coronavirus field, which has been dominated in the agricultural industry, has shown that um, effective immunity usually requires more than that. In addition, an, a completely antibody-focused approach uh, uh, I think uh, always raises the, uh, the, this, the, the possibility of eliciting what's referred to as antibody enhancement of disease, where actually you find that antibodies or antibody-biased immune responses actually are not protective and, in fact, some cases can actually accelerate infection and disease through complex mechanisms that are not completely understood. For that reason, we, again, feel very strongly that we want to elicit very strong cellular responses to a broad array of host antigens. Now, some of these are on the surface. S protein, it gathers the most attention in this particular virus. But actually, the most abundant protein on the surface of the virus is the M protein. That's part of our, uh, that's part of our vaccine um, um, approach is to uh, have the M protein in there. The E protein also is on the surface. And the N protein being the major uh, capsid protein of the virus uh, is also uh, um, a very important to have in, in a vaccine formulation. And so uh, there's, it, part of this is conceptual uh, about you know, how immune systems generate protective immunity. And part of it is, uh, is derived from specific studies of vaccine efforts in the original SARS virus and in other coronaviruses, which have shown the importance of the N protein as being part of the vaccine. Okay, that's very important, and, and thank you for highlighting that. Um, and then there's one more question from the webcast, um, and I know you already answered it, but recognizing people are probably furiously taking notes. Can you just highlight um, other applications of this type of technology? You know, we talk about a lot um, between ourselves, the plug-and-play nature. Can you highlight one more time how this could be used in other indications besides coronavirus? Sure. Um, our our lab's uh, main focus is 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 really um, developing the technologies that are broadly applicable for a number of purposes. So, for example, <clears throat> we the display vaccine technologies that we're developing are also uh, applicable to the development of exosome-based uh, uh, receptor decoy types of drugs. Um, so there are a number of biologics out there that are based on single uh, uh, proteins that are injected and uh, act by targeting a circulating factor that is, for example, pro-inflammatory. And some of these molecules are very effective at arthritis uh, treatment we think they're, they're fantastic drugs. 
we think that displaying some of those drugs on exosomes actually has the potential to make those drugs even more effective for a couple of reasons. One of which is that exosomes, as I mentioned in my opening statements, tend to accumulate at sites of vascular leakiness, and sites of inflammation are vascularly leaky. So we think that it actually has the potential to target those types of therapeutics to the sites in the body where they're needed most. On top of that, the exosome display uh, puts a lot of the drug in a very small area and changes uh, significantly the binding constants uh, for their target protein. We feel that this may make them much more effective um, uh, uh, inhibitors of some of these uh, uh, pro-inflammatory signaling molecules, which could either lead to A, uh, enhanced efficacy, or B, uh, actually a reduction in the amount of material that needs to be injected uh, per dose in order to get a therapeutic benefit. So we think that these are really exciting uh, possibilities. Of course, you know, there, there are many, many variations on exosomes that one can imagine for all kinds of type, uh, 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 applications, but that's just one. Um, and likewise, the mRNA uh, vaccine that we're developing is actually uh, helping us understand how to use exosome RNA uh, uh, formulations uh, in, in treatment of other types of diseases that could be amenable to mRNA delivery. Um, and you know, the, the list there is, is quite extensive, and um, I'm, I'm sure people can imagine how that could apply without going into any specific examples. Yeah, thank you. I think that was very helpful. Um, are there any more questions, Melissa? There are no other questions at this time. I'll turn the floor back to you for any final comments. So, uh, Dr. Gould, thank you so much. Um, every time I listen to you, I learn as well. And so um, I hope that everybody enjoyed the presentation as much as I did. Um, together with Dr. Gould, Capricor is looking forward to expanding our exosome-based platform and joining um, in the battle against the novel coronavirus. In this pursuit, our goal will be to develop a vaccine that is different from anything else that is currently in development. I'd just like to highlight uh, one last thing, and that is that Capricor is not a passive bystander in this uh, development. Uh, Dr. Gould's lab will be uh, running primarily with the research and early stage development of the product. And then this is where Capricor will be able to provide real value to the development in that we have uh, tremendous experience both in cell therapy and also in the isolation, purification, and growing of exosomes. So we envision ourselves as his ideal partner uh, in the product development aspect of this. And we believe that working together um, in concert with his colleagues at Johns Hopkins and our team here at Capricor, that we will bring this important therapeutic forward, but also set the stage for the development of a platform for exosomes uh, for which we have been working over the last several years to bring to the fore. So I would like to thank you this morning for joining our call. Um, thank you very much for uh, your time this morning or early afternoon for you on the East Coast, Dr. Gould. I know that you're working literally 20 hours a day on this, and I can uh, affirm that from our frequent conversations. So thank you, and uh, let's all stay in touch and, and hope that uh, we can go back to work in our lives very soon. Have a good day. Thank you. This concludes today's teleconference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.